Welcome to Islam in the Public Square. My name is Randy Ermston. I'm chair of the Bishops Committee for the Episcopal Church in Western Washington. The Bishops Committee is one of many sponsors of this conference. They're listed in your folder. Before going any further, I'd like to acknowledge Mary Newman of the Bishops Committee and St. Thomas Episcopal Parish and Muhammad Jawad Kaki of the Ithna Ahiri Muslim Association of the Northwest in Kirkland, who conceived of and led the implementation of this conference. Would they stand? Mary Newman is over there, and Jawad. <laughs> Jawad, Jawad, can you stand up? And Mary, come on forward just a little bit and see who Mary is. See, they're incredible activists. Thank you. I will give you a short overview of the program today. After uh, Bishop Rickles' welcome, we will hear four different perspectives by distinguished speakers on understanding Islam and our Muslim, Muslim neighbor. That, that will be followed by a coffee break. Then we will ask you in small groups to, dis to discuss the presentations and develop questions for the afternoon panel. So it's important that you have a Muslim in your t on your table and that you're, if you're and that you, if you have, it looks like we're done pretty well getting the tables together. The uh, panel discussion this afternoon will have all the speakers, and all, in addition, we'll have Anila Fasali, and uh, Phil Ginsburg will be the moderator. In these small groups, we hope that you and uh, you'll have, all have table captains that you'll come up with questions for the panel as a result of the presentations this morning. At 12.15, we'll have lunch, and uh, it'll be available in the entryway to the right, to my right. And at 12.55, there'll be a call to prayer, followed by Muslim prayers in, in the uh, southern end of this assembly area. At 1.15, Phil Ginsburg will monitor the panel discussion that I mentioned of questions generated from the presentations this morning. And, uh, and after a short break at 3 p.m., we will uh, have a film that confronts stereotypes in American Muslims fact or fiction. There will be a breakout session followed by one minute takeaway reports by a representative of each group. To get started, it is my pleasure to introduce Bishop Gregory H. Rickel, the eighth elected bishop of the Diocese of Olympia, serving all Episcopalians in Western Washington. Bishop Rickel embraces radical hospitality that welcomes all, no matter where they find themselves on their journey of faith. He envisions a church that is safe and authentic and an authentic community in which to explore God's intimate goodness, and grace as revealed in the life and continuing revelation of Jesus Christ. It was Bishop Rickles' leadership in interfaith work going back to his involvement in the Confronting Islamophobia Conference in 2011 through his recent video series, Meeting Our Muslim Neighbors, that inspired the Bishop's Committee to pursue this conference. Bishop Rickles. Thank you, everyone. It looks like the weather played into our hands today, so it's a good place to be. Uh, thank you, Randy, and I want to thank uh, the committee that kind of flies under my name. Uh, they inspire me continuously, and I appreciate them uh, inviting me here and putting this on today. It's the greatest honor and privilege to be here to welcome all of you and to give thanks for and with all of you for being willing on a rainy Saturday to come together to try to better understand our neighbors especially in these days we find ourselves living in. In December, now nearly a year ago, I began my blog with these words. The words are getting dangerous. Fear is winning. Some, some among us are becoming self-fulfilling prophets, playing into the hands of those who wish us harm instead of living out of our better angels. So much of what we are hearing today was exactly the talk that led to Japanese internment camps, and the concentration camps and the gas chambers of Germany, it's really easy to downplay that. Many did then, too. 
I went on in that blog to say more about what I saw happening in this election and in our country. It would be easy to say what our election reveals about the candidates and leave it at that. But what is more daunting to me is what it says about us. And it proves we have a lot of work yet to do. Just yesterday, the Refugee Resettlement Office, which our diocese operates and has for nearly 40 years, who is resettling by and large Muslim families from Iraq and Syria and many other countries, reported that their office received four harassing phone calls from different individuals in the last few days, all vaguely threatening. Now, I'm just repeating what they said. All of them had this line in it, that if Trump gets elected, the resettlement office will be shut down. There was a lot of anti-refugee rhetoric that was added in. And he told us it sounded like these individuals were all reading from a similar script. They're doing their work. The office has also been vandalized with graffiti several times, all within a short span, and this keeps happening. We in all of our faith traditions have seen this before. We all know some version of it, and quite frankly, we all have been the perpetrators as well. When Jesus was crucified, it was easy to blame the Jews as a whole, and when that became unpopular or difficult, we blamed the Romans. Even centuries later on, Good Friday, when reading the Passion Gospel, often hordes of Christians would flood out of churches into the Jewish neighborhoods, terrorizing and in some cases murdering them on account of that version of the story. This is exactly what's happening now, blaming a whole people, a whole religion, for specific acts, acts perpetrated by evil people, not the entirety of a race or a belief system. These days and these words are no different. I'm saddened by the numbers that sign up for such blatant generalization. And I'm even more concerned and baffled as what it says about us as a people. A few years ago, I met Arsalan Bukhari, the Executive Director of CARE Washington, the Council on American Islamic Relations. He's a fine man and a friend, and I've always been blessed to be in his company. But a few months before that December blog, before the tensions I was writing about had reared its ugly head, I asked him a simple question. How can your Christian sisters and brothers be neighbors to you and our Muslim sisters and brothers? And that question began a dialogue and eventually the idea of a series of videos at my request and invitation. We had no idea how important those would become or how many would watch them. The idea of them was to teach and for us Christians to learn and to not just accept the sound bites or the hate as the truth. This day is about the same. It is an effort to break down the stereotypes that we consciously hold, and perhaps even more those we unconsciously hold. It will not be easy work, and it will have to go on beyond today. But I will say, as a Christian, it is our work. So today, I thank you for being here. But I'm going to ask something of you, too. I believe, personally, what has been said by many a person smarter than me, that our prayers to God are not for God. They are for us. They are designed and put to voice as calls to us. We cannot just serve them up and hope God does something with them. We are part of the equation. We have to listen to the prayers and then get up and move, act, do something. Today is one way we do that, but what will be most important is what you do with what you learn today, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next. So I urge a quest for more knowledge and facts and relationships instead of accepting the unexamined hyperbole often put forward. I urge a more positive response to this fear, one which might challenge and stretch you, but one that is more about leaning into this issue instead of running from the unexamined and the unknown. Engage this issue in your community and in your church. Learn, grow, share, change. I believe nothing less than our souls and the souls of this country are at stake. Thank you and God bless you.